Thank you all for subscribing. And um, I'm really excited to be uh, hosting our first session of this next group of five of five works and five uh, themes in our emotion series. Um, I'm really excited to be starting with, with Edward Hopper, uh, who is an artist who I have always uh, admired and loved, um, mainly for the quietness of his paintings. Um, and I think their ambiguity as well. And I think that's something that, uh, that many of us um, will, uh, will know about, about him if, if you've spent some time looking at his work. Um, for those of you who've been to the States, uh, Edward Hopper's paintings are primarily in, in major collections there. Following his death um, in, in the 1960s, um, his wife, who died shortly after him, donated, I, I think, sort of almost 3,000 works to uh, the Whitney Museum in New York, which was the first museum dedicated to um, uh, modern American painting or modern American art, um, and is certainly worth a visit, not only to see the Hoppers, but to see, to see everything else. Um, and other famous works by him are in the Art Institute of Chicago, MoMA, um, of course, the Whitney and, and the National Gallery of Art in Washington as well. So let's get started with looking at the picture. Um, something different tonight, something modern, um, and we can, we can get a sense of that straight away. Um, this painting was painted in, in 1927, um, and it's about 68 centimetres, I think, by around 90 centimetres, so it's quite, uh, it's quite small. We are looking at a painting on canvas, um, and it's painted using oils. Um, in fact, it's, it's a great image. We can see even the weave of the canvas if you look into the dark pigments, um, and even some of the, um, I think some of the paint drips as well, um, which gives us a sense of the, uh, the thinness of application of the medium onto the canvas, which, um, is quite nice to see in this image. Um, we are looking at an interior scene, um, which is very effectively, shall we say, lit. Um, I think light is certainly protagonist in this, um, in this scene. We can see uh, how it's falling on various parts of the architecture. Um, and most, most noticeably, we can see these uh, strip lights, or at least um, consecutive uh, lamps, um, reflected in what is a massive window, which provides the backdrop to, to the um, entire composition. Um, there is uh, various colours used for the paintwork in the room, um, a sort of orangey colour, white colour, there is a, a red skirting border around the floor, um, a, a whitish floor, which is um, sort of seems to be some sort of liner or something like that. Um, a, a radiator that's standing prominently um, in the corner of the room. Uh, and we can see that the, the window on the far left is probably a door um, it has a, a sort of metal uh, lower part, a sort of metal skirting and also metal handles there. Um, so we just get the glimpse of the door of this space. Um, there's another metal bar across a window, the window above the radiator. We've got the staircase on the far right, then lower right, you can see the oak chair, this, um, this kind of dark oak, which is of course then uh, repeated in the in the chair on which the figure is sitting and the empty chair opposite her and also the oak that's underneath the um, marble topped round table. Um, these rather ornate brass banisters are leading somewhere um, but we cannot see where they're leading but they suggest um, they suggest another floor another layer. Um, at the back of the space is a bowl of fruit, a bowl that's grow, a glass bowl seemingly that's groaning with fruit. 
Um, and then in front of it, we have this figure who is uh, the only visible living figure in the scene. Um, she is sitting at this table with her arms resting on the table. One of her hands is gloved, um, the other is not. And the hand that is wearing the glove is holding a saucer and the other one is clutching um, this cup of what looks like coffee. Um, she's wearing a, a, a sort of thick green coat uh, trimmed with, uh, again, what looks like perhaps fur. And she's also got a uh, saucer in front of her or a small plate. Um, we can see under the table her two legs, which sort of are lit quite prominently um, and have certainly been kind of drawn attention to. Um, and we can see that she's wearing, uh, you know, a, a lower cut top beneath her, her coat. But the fact that she's wearing a glove and also a hat suggests that, um, she has been outside um, and that the weather is not fair, that this is perhaps an autumn um, or a winter scene um, and she has failed to take off her, her hat and one of her gloves. So I think that's um, sort of mapped out the, the space that we're sitting in. I think the, um, the, the chair lower right, this sort of oak, chair that we see I think is or this dark brown chair that we see I think is quite an important element in the composition because this feature makes us as viewers feel as though we too are in this space we are inhabiting this space it's been nothing's been made of this chair it's kind of been cut off as if it's a um a, a, a sort of a photograph which which will come to you shortly um but it immediately it, it, it shows a, a composition that's not sort of perfectly balanced, but that's giving us a snapshot um, of a space um, and that we, are, we are, are sort of on the edge of that space and that we are, are a part of it. Um, and the chair suggests perhaps a chair that is sitting opposite us. Um, so all at once, we're sort of um, a part of this environment, but we're also very much um, a voyeur. We are on the same side of the window as the figure in the space, uh, but there very much is a sense of kind of looking in and looking, um, looking at her um, as as the sort of um, the central focus, um, and and there's not very much else to 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 really focus on. There's this big bowl of fruit behind her. Um, but our attention is certainly certainly drawn drawn to her. Now, I don't know how how the painting makes um, how make, how it makes you all feel. Um, I, I'd be interested to know if anyone wanted to share any comments for for later discussion in the chat. Um, but I feel that that the painting is while it. Um, while it documents this sort of lonely this lonely situation for this this person this this woman that is is clearly in a, a in a, a space alone very much uh, introspective she's looking down at her coffee cup um, and she's very much in her own head she's not really aware of what's going on around her i also find it sort of a strangely comforting image and i um having sort of done some reading around Hopper. I think it's very interesting with his works how um, often he paints these slightly disturbing or um, slightly uh, disquieting images, but in some way they access a, a sort of deeper psychology in ourself um, and it makes us feel in some way sort of comforted. Um, it's slightly like, I think, if you are alone for Christmas, it's so much worse that everyone else is with other people and with their families. If you are alone for Christmas and someone else is alone for Christmas, you feel better about it. And I think in this situation, in looking at this painting, seeing this figure, 
there is a sense of comfort that her being on her own and her being isolated and alone makes that okay for the rest of us. And I think while it's a sad in, in image in some ways, it, it also um, accesses and finds comfort um, in others. Um, so what's really interesting is that the reflection of the light that we see the lights, the, the, the sort of the consecutive lamps that we see on the ceiling are reflected in this enormous window, but there's nothing else reflected, which again makes the scene quite unnerving because um, there's obviously a whole load of activity going on behind us that we aren't able to see uh, in the window, aren't able to see reflected, but we know that there's space behind us because it's projecting forward in the reflection. Um, and added to which we can't see anything outside of the window um, that's that's sort of providing the backdrop for the for the picture. So while we're being um, while the the, the 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 sort of area behind us is being obscured, the area beyond the window is also being obscured as well. Now, this painting is called Automat. Um, and for those of you who don't know what an Automat is, it's a sort of fast food, um, it's a, 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 as far as I can tell, it's a sort of fast food uh, restaurant without waiters and waitresses. It's certainly somewhere where it's somewhere to grab something fast and then to leave again. And I think um, in this in this sort of um, capacity, this space is unusual because it should feel like a bustling space where people are coming in quickly to have something to eat and to drink and to leave again, rather than for someone to be sitting in this space and pondering and being pensive and taking time and spending um, spending, spending time there uh, thinking as we can see this lady doing. Added to which what's also unnerving is that she's decided to sit right at the center of the space, right at the center of the, of the um of the automat of the restaurant so she's in the least she's in the most conspicuous location in a way for a uh, situation or a meditative moment such as this in a way uh this this is something that this this moment or or um uh the situation that she's in suggests that she might have wanted to nestle into a corner somehow but in this painting she's she's exposed and she's, she's centrally, centrally placed, which adds to uh, a sense of, of vulnerability. Um, it's, the Hoppe's paintings um, tend to focus on these day-to-day, um, -day, or day-to-day -day American life. Um, they, they also focus on the kind of mundane, so they will um, they will document uh, very uh, mundane features of um, of 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 yeah of, of your day to day existence. So petrol stations, um, uh, restaurants such as this, uh, railway stations, hotel rooms, hotel lobbies, um, and and added to which he often he's very interested in this idea of transients and moments and places of uh, sort of in between places. Um, so this is obviously somewhere that you would pass through. We have no idea where this woman has come from, where she's going. And in the same way, he often paints uh, trains, he often paints, um, uh, well, he paints train carriages, um, he's interested in, in cars. Um, so, so this idea of, of, of movement and travel is also uh, interesting. So the idea of, of moving out of your kind of comfort, your comfortable life, so out of your, um, your, your home and your work life and into a place that's transitory uh, and less, uh, less comforting. Um, and again, that all adds to this uh, sort of disquieting element in his work. Um, and the door that we see on the left and the staircase that we see on the right, those are both elements, those are both uh, parts of this, that those are suggestive of places to go, um, but A, we don't know where, 
much like the, the the scene outside the window and and b she's not going anywhere so there's the option to leave but she's very much um sort of in this sort of firmly rooted in this space so this all adds the ambiguity uh, of the painting um and often you'll see in his paintings you know roads that lead into woods or uh or, or, or rail tracks or streets that that you can't see where they where they finish and i think um, the idea of of kind of the unknown um, at the end of the journey um, is is all adds sort of layers and depth to to his paintings, and all add as I say this ambiguity and this ability as a viewer to be able to read them, to be able to read them as as you wish. For example, the the fact we can't see anything out of the window is quite unusual because if this is an automat in New York City, which it's likely to be. Um, we would normally see lights, cars, shops outside, but we can't see anything. So um, again, it's quite trapping and quite oppressive um, that we haven't been given this view beyond the, the pane of glass. And Hop is very interested in incorporating windows and glass into his pictures. You'll notice the idea of witnessing something from behind a window, um, which of course will cut out any sense of noise um, or, or um, sort of insight into conversations or what's going on, um, or, or, or being on, another, on the other side of glass, whether you're in an interior space looking out to an open space, be it a, a hotel room or, um, in this case, a restaurant. So you can see these recurring features um, in his work. Um, so... This is, where does this come in Hopper's career? This is an early picture. He paints this, as I say, in, 19, in 1927. Um, and this is a time, of course, um, sort of leading into the late 1920s, um, that sort of art is going through uh, a real um, sort of transition. Um, and that's largely spurred by the migration of European artists coming over to the States following World War I uh, from Europe. So there's an injection of kind of European influence into America at this time. Um, but then in the ensuing years, so following the 1920s, going into the 1930s, naturally the Great Depression uh, strikes in October of 1929, the stock market crashes, and there's this incredible economic downturn in the States, which caused artists to create and look elsewhere. So there was this surge of creativity and um, in a sense, uh, sort of enlightened, artistic enlightenment during the 1930s. Um, and of course, from the European artists, you have the, in, or the European schools, you're having this in, the uh, influence of uh, movements such as surrealism um, and, um, and, and this is having a, a real effect on, uh, on the American artists. And that goes through this shift in the 1920s, 1930s, um, and then gets spat out the other side in late 1940s, really as abstract expressionism. So then you are moving through into um, a period with artists like Jackson Pollock, uh, Mark Rothko, who start looking at Cubist paintings and surrealist paintings um, and then lose the, uh, lose the, as you, as I'm sure you know, lose this sort of any sense of, uh, of figurativeness in their paintings and move into almost entire or complete abstraction. Um, but we're not going to go there today. But um, Hopper is a very interesting artist because he sits in this moment of immense creativity um, and, uh, and experimentation. But what he's doing is he's actually maintaining a very realist style, which unfortunately for him meant that his career took a long time to get off the ground. Um, he was um, working in this um, uh, sort of antiquated style um, as we've just uh, started to explore, very much uh, layered with a psychological depth um, however, he is painting it using very, um, uh, very a kind of clear structure in his paintings, very architectural, very laid out. Um, he's using 
uh, he's focusing a lot on, on color, he's focusing on light, um, and he's painting quite, albeit softly formed, but quite classical figures. So he's painting in a very realist, quite traditional manner, which is a very brave and bold move when there is so much being moved and shaped uh, around, him, um, around you at this time. Um, but he stays resolute and very much maintains this style throughout, throughout his career. Um, he, he was born in 1882, so he does very much bridge this kind of late 19th century, early 20th century, um, this, this huge transitional um, period. And he was born in New York State and he stays there really for his whole life. Um, he dies in, 19, in the 1960s, 1967. Um, and he really stays in the US. He has several trips to Paris, which um, of course was the, the center of, um, of, of European painting at this time. Um, and he comes across works by um, sort of all manner of artists naturally, but he was very, um, uh, he was very taken by the works of uh, Manet, Edouard Manet, and, um, and also Ed, um, Edgar Degas. So naturally, when you think of these artists and you think of Hopper's work, um, you can kind of see an affinity, um, for those of you who are familiar with Manet and Degas' work, of, of the, the artists of this period, they maintain this quite figurative style, and they're very interested in portraying day-to-day -day Parisian modern life. Um, and that's ultimately what Hopper is doing uh, in America. Um, added to which, they are um, artists that are very, um, they, they often tend to crop their paintings in quite unusual ways. So they, their compositions are, as we discussed with the chair um, and the door on the left, their compositions uh, are truncated, almost like a photograph as Hopper does. And, that, that is um, largely to do with um, the invention and proliferation of photography at this time, that it had both an impact on painters, um, but also that painters um, such as Hopper started then to have an impact on photographers so, um, and filmmakers. So that there's, this, um, there's this cycle um, when it comes to this exchange between um, photography and painting. Um, and Hopper, on that note, certainly has had um, a huge impact on uh, on on filmmakers right up to the to the present day, um, and and also on to, on on photographers both of of his period and also subsequent um, eras. Um, for example, his painting "House by the Railroad." Um, was the, uh, many of you may know this, but it was the uh, inspiration for Hitchcock's, um, uh, Hitchcock's, Hitchcock's movie Psycho. Um, and there are other references. Alfred Hitchcock was a great admirer of Hopper. Um, and there are other references, both in vendors as well, um, uh, and, and other photographers working at this time, um, where you can see a, a very strong alignment between their work and, um, and his his paintings. Um, and this is largely to do with their kind of cinematic uh, compositions, but also to do, of course, with this uh, psychological depth. Um, so Hopper was, was born, as I say, he was born in, um, in New York State. Um, he spent, he was born into quite a wealthy family and um, he, he started, he was, start, he was able to start uh, drawing and, and um, creating from quite a young age. And his earliest uh, works are actually very visibly um, uh, um, precursors to the work that he starts to create later on in his career. They're very realist, they're very interested in, um, or they're very concerned with this com combination of, of light and, and shadow. Um, and, and he maintains this style going forward. Um, he trains actually for six years um, at the New York um, Art School, Fine Art School. Um, and he trains with um, some sort of um, Robert Hon um, Henry, Robert Henry, who was a kind of leading um, American artist um, of the Ashcan School. So um, he was painting in 
quite a realist style, um, but very much interested in um, in European influence and um, and 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 sort of documenting day to day day to day life. Um, but and Hopper was was um, was was very much influenced by by him. Um, he he tends to um, uh, his his career sort of doesn't take off really until later in the 1920s. I mean, by the time he paints this painting in 1927, he's very much um, he's very much on his way to success. Um, but remember, he was born in 82, so you know he's already um, sort of getting into to his middle age by the time, by the 1930s, which is really his decade of, of great success. Um, and he it takes a long time for him to get off the ground. And I think that is largely to do with this, this antiquated style. Um, he works all the way through into the 1920s um, as a, an illustrator uh, for um, an advertising agency. So, Again, um, you have this, you have this, um, th th this very kind of almost graphic uh, approach to painting, which, which um, of course, uh, it makes a lot of sense that he was working as an, an illustrator. Um, and if you, as I said earlier, if you look at the artists that started to create around him at this time, they were pushing in all sorts of different directions, um, but. Edward Hopper was um, remained resolute and was criticised for this. He was um, had had a very poor reception. Um, his his work, particularly in the nineteen twenties when he was starting out, um, was 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 not well received at all. Um, but when he gets sort of into the nineteen thirties, um, he he starts to gain uh, sort of major patrons and and major museums uh, start start to acquire his his work. Um, and actually, while a lot of artists were impacted by the Great Depression, um, Hopper uh, wasn't really, um, despite the fact that his works did draw on a number of the themes that came out of this period, one of which, of course, being this idea of movement and mass migration. There was a huge a surge of migration um, to the west coast of America due to droughts during the 1930s. Um, uh, and, and there were these huge dust storms known as that um, took place in, in the Dust Bowl, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Um, and so a number of people were uprooting and moving out to, to, um, to the coasts. And so this idea of mass migration um, and of course the general, uh, the general sort of psychological mood at this time was, um, was one of, um, of, of some melancholy and despair um, and, and both of these, all of these themes are, are of course reflected in, um, in Hopper's paintings. Um, he marries in the 1920s, he marries a lady called uh, Josephine Niverson um, and she is a really important feature of his career and um, she's very relevant looking at Automat because she, uh, she's actually the model for this lady that we're looking at um, at the center of the painting. And, 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 um, and, and Jo, his wife, as she was known, she models for a large number of, um, of Hopper's works. Um, and uh, almost all of the women you see, these isolated uh, female figures are, um, are of, of his wife, Jo. And she was an artist too. He knew her from, from art school um, and they sort of reacquainted, they, they reconnected uh, married um, and had a very long and happy life together. Um, and as I say, she died shortly after him in the in the nineteen sixties. Um, and she bequeathed uh, a lot of his work to the Whitney. Um, and she was responsible really for for his. Um, she was an artist herself, so she of course understood it. But not only was she a model and his his muse, but she was really the the powerhouse behind his his business and his commissions and. Uh, she sort of managed him really, so she was a very important feature uh, in his life for several reasons. Um, I just want to go back, go back to the painting a little bit, um, and just have a think about um, what this what this woman might be might be doing. And I think there's no answer to this. Um, 
you know, it, it's interesting to, to think that it's dark outside. So I, I don't know, is this, is this, this is of course at night or this is um, in the darker hours, um, but is this late at night? Is this in the middle of the night that the automat's completely empty? Um, is it early in the morning? Um, is she is she sort of on her way somewhere, stopping for a quick coffee? Um, as I say, it looks like she's actually there to stay rather than moving in and out quickly. She's got a plate which would have probably had something else on it, so she's had enough time there to to have had something to eat. Um, her legs are crossed, and I think her legs are are quite important to draw attention to. I think in in the 1920s, the, the idea of, of sort of revealing your legs in this way was quite, um, was probably quite uh, unusual, quite risque. Um, and, and what Hopper does here is he, light, he lights them very, very prominently in this picture. They are actually quite, um, quite distracting. Um, and this isn't the only time he does this. He does this in uh, another painting called Hotel Lobby, a later painting where he, um, draws draws attention to to two women's legs sitting in a hotel lobby um, by lighting them with this very white this very stark uh, light um, and um, and and I and I think it's quite interesting he does he does it also in another another painting of a train carriage a lady sitting in a train carriage um, which 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 is actually closer in date to this painting in the, in the nineteen thirties um, uh, so so again um sort of disturbing uh sort of uh unusual um I'm, I'm not quite sure of the intention behind it um but but all adds to the sort of dystopian feel uh in in a way of of his pictures um the fact she's removed only one glove is quite also quite unnerving because um although she feels as though she's been sitting there for some time and she's clutching onto this saucer and this coffee cup. Uh, she's still wearing a glove, so that also suggests that she may not have been there for very long, and she's only had time to remove one. Or perhaps she's perhaps she's cold, so she's kept her glove on, but she's just removed one. It, it's a painting that that um, that sort of uh, instills a huge uh, or in, in, um, instigates a, a large number of questions in all of us, I think, um, uh, as to what what exactly. What exactly she is she is doing, um, and she's she's certainly uh, she's certainly in her in her own mind. She's having a, a enjoying an introspective uh, introspective moment, and I think that's really why I chose Hopper when we're looking at this theme of loneliness, because um, really that's largely what his paintings are all about. Um, they they speak of being alone. Um, in quiet places, um, and uh, as I say, I think that 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 as viewers, um, there is quite a, a there is a great deal of, of comfort that can be can be found in that. Um, the the addition of the the element the sort of added uh, element of the radiator in the corner of the room and the fruit bowl, uh, in my view, sort of it adds to the loneliness by having these inanimate objects um, keeping her company uh, or the chair or the banisters you do um, again it sort of the fact that she is there and alive um, it, it, it is 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 kind of um, stark in contrast and there's no um, there's no real um, in, in, in a way it's it's similar to when someone is is painted in the nude uh, but they are painted wearing uh, perhaps a pair of shoes. You sort of almost no notice their nakedness more. Um, and so here, by having these added ele elements in the composition, um, but that are not living and that are stationary, um, does does sort of make her make her jump out even even more. Um, Hopper sort of gains recognition in the 1930s. I, I said, said that he, he had a number of his works required by uh, major institutions. And in 1933, he was actually given his first retrospective um, at, uh, at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So really the, the greatest kind of accolade uh, that one could, could ask for. 
um, as an artist. Um, he he enjoys really successful a successful career throughout the 1930s and into the 1940s, um, and these are really his most productive decades. Um, this is when he paints his famous painting, The Night Hawks, which he paints in 1948, uh, which is, the, is at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and in the 50s and 60s, he sort of simmers down a little bit. In the 30s, he bought a house in South Truro on Cape Cod with his wife, with Joe, um, and they visited the, the, the summer house every year since the mid 30s, and they enjoyed uh, a lot of time there in the 50s and 60s, and he didn't produce a huge amount of work. Um, one thing that is important to know is that he was an incredibly slow and methodical worker, and these paintings um, took great time for him to paint. He, I think, would paint sort of roughly five paintings a year, um, and over his lifetime painted only 350 odd pictures. Um, that said, he was uh, very keen on etching, and actually that's where he started gaining recognition really with his etchings, which you can tell in his style, in the, in the way that he, in his painting style, that he would be um, sort of graphic illustrator in that way. Um, and his, his kind of slow and, and uh, methodical technique in painting is, uh, is really kind of um, outlined by the num large number of drawings uh, that are in existence uh, by Hopper, um, or, or at least that, that, that we know he painted for certain works, one of which was um, a painting of the interior of a cinema, which is in MoMA, um, and uh, for this painting we have 56 extant kind of preparatory drawings um, by Hopper for, for the composition. So he really does take great care um, to map out to map out his, his pictures before, before painting them. And I think you get a real sense of that, you know, notice in this picture the very, very gentle and soft um, uh, angles that he uses in order to give a sense of your precise and exact location um, in the space. Um, he dies in, as I say, in 1967, um, and he was buried up um, near where he was born, upstate New York. Um, and his 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 wife, um, Joe, died shortly after him. Um, Hopper's work doesn't tend to come onto the market that much. Uh, he, as I say, he doesn't he didn't paint a large number of works, and when it does, it's um, it, it, it's it's hugely valuable. Um, but there are a large number of his works in, in museums um, and, and of course several in private collections as well. So when it does, it, it really is like, like gold dust. And as I say, he's not only inspired other artists, um, including strangely artists that were abstract painters, in, including um, artists like Mark Rothko, probably from these kind of wide spans of single color, uh, particularly in a painting like this, we could see that Rothko might have been influenced um, by him. Um, but but um, artists that, that, that you wouldn't sort of think um, really, really looked, looked at Hopper. But uh, as we've said, also filmmakers, um, poets, um, uh, authors, um, and, and also photographers. Um, Alain de Botton, for those of you who are avid readers, is a, um, a, a massive fan of Hopper. And he writes a lot about him and he writes very beautifully about Hopper and su sums up really what Hopper's work is all about. So I would um, highly recommend reading some of his work on, on Hopper. Uh, 